the community data program. I'm on the, um, the team over here. Um, we are doing this orientation today on the community data program and the partnership we're developing with the local immigration partnerships, which is all of you. Um, I am with also Lisa Davis and Lisa is with the City of Calgary and she's going to be the coordinator for this pilot network. So she's going to be the key contact for all of you. So today we're just going to present and introduce the community data program itself, as well as this framework that we're developing for the, uh, what we're calling the LIP pilot, the LIP network pilot. Uh, anytime you'd like to ask questions, feel free. There's a chat box on your screen. Um, Lisa and myself will just keep an eye on it and try to answer your questions as we go along. And if not, um, hold them to the end and we will take some questions at the end and get into a bit of discussion if, if need be. Um, also, please use the chat box if you have any technical problems during the presentation. My colleague Julie is also participating today and she's going to answer any of those questions and hopefully be able to uh, troubleshoot you through any problems that come up as we go. Um, you can also let us know if the volume level is not working or if we're cutting in and out or anything like that. So let's, uh, let's get going. So we're going to try to cover quite a lot today. Um, we're going to go over the, um, the foundation of the community data program. We're going to describe to you how membership is set up. Um, now today, normally we have just the typical membership route, but we also have a special route, which is going to be just for the LIPS. So we're going to explain that to the best of our ability today. And Lisa is going to take everyone through that. We're also going to cover what data sets are available as well as the tools and program resources we have. I'm going to share a few examples of what our members have done with the data. I think this will just give you a good indication of uh, what other people in our network are doing. Uh, hopefully it will give you some ideas and encourage you with what you can do with your own work on immigration. And finally, Lisa is going to take us through um, the next steps for the partnership and just the future possibilities. So what comes next? So I'm going to begin. I'm going to just give you this background on the community data program. So the community data program was established back in the 1990s. The catalyst for the program came from developing a cost sharing strategy for buying data primarily from Statistics Canada. The goal was to better was to be better able to analyze and report on socioeconomic trends at this small area geography. So really trying to look at as small a geography as possible, like the neighborhood level. So today, the Community Data Program, or the CDP, as we often call ourselves, uh, provides access to a wealth of unique data products and serves the needs of hundreds of organizations across Canada. Member organizations are part of a consortium, which is a legal entity, a legal entity sorry, focused on the implementation of a public service goal. They are established at the community level. So for example, there's one consortium in Toronto and there's a different one for Calgary. And we have many of them across the country. Local community data consortia participate in the national network um, of the community data program. And they provide leadership and oversight in the program. Today, the community, the consortium model has evolved into um, more than just part of the community data program, but has actually become a tool for community development and sort of local community involvement and network. And we'll discuss the consortium model a bit more when we talk about, when Lisa talks about membership later on. This will just give you an, an idea of how broad our membership is. Uh, we actually have members from all sorts of different sectors. So municip municipal governments, local United Way chapters, community health centers, many social planning councils, um, specialized organizations like school boards. Um, we already have um, people who work in immigration and youth services, as well as libraries, and then also a number of economic development agencies. 
agencies. So you can see that we, we really do cover a vast array of organizations. So overall, the real point of the program is to provide evidence for decision making and to monitor and report on trends at the neighborhood level. So how do we do this? Um, overall, we do our best to make it easy to find and access the data. We make it much more efficient to do so. We acquire customized data based on what the needs of members actually are. We are still very much into reducing costs of data. And then we also have done more and more about building capacity so that we can actually do more with the data, especially for our modest and um, medium capacity users, really trying to put tools in their hands so they can take those numbers and take those data tables and transform them into a story that they can tell for their community. We also, through our network, advocate, advocate for more community data and can find um, just make more agreements for finding community data that we can put into your hands. So overall, our members get um, sort of three main categories of things. They get the data itself, they get capacity building. So this includes um, tools and resources and trainings on how to use the data. And then also part of our network, so our national network, um, we have teleconferences and annual face-to-face -face events um, and different webinars. We have a chance to actually discuss um, different topics around data. So now I'm going to hand it over to Lisa and she's going to just discuss this um, membership route that we've outlined for the LIP network. Hi everyone. Um, let me know if you have any problems hearing me. If I periodically am muting, it's just because I'm sick and probably having a sneeze, but I am still here with you and we'll walk you through this piece. So Mary's gonna touch on, you know, and has already led up to the typical membership route um, through a formal consortium, um, but, with the lips, of course, we had to craft something that was unique and was able to meet the needs um, of our lips across the country. So many of you will have known because we've had many emails back and forth in trying to build a distribution lift, a list to begin with because IRCC didn't have one. So when I've sent out emails, um, you guys have been kind enough to forward it to your colleagues in areas where you know there's a lip and uh, they weren't on my list. And I've been sharing the info as we've kind of moved along this piece. This first year really was more on the administrative side in terms of, of um, setting up the administrative requirements, finances, and all of those different pieces. So if you look at the slide that I have up there right now, you will see the locations of consortia across the country. Have a quick peek to see if your area happens to be reflected there or not. In some cases, um, like Winnipeg, the consortia is actually broader than the city of Winnipeg. So some of these are regional, um, but others are specific to the city that you see. Mary, I'm not sure if you'd like to touch on this one before I move on to the next slide. Um, Lisa, I was thinking we should just go ahead and ask that poll question too, so we get a good handle on um, how it, who knows who's had a chance to connect to their local consortium. So I'm just going to put that up on the screen right now. Black a slide. I'm just going to give us one more minute. This So this is just very helpful for Lisa to know um, where everybody stands, if they've had a chance to connect with their local consortia or not. I'm going to just give you 30 more seconds for that.
Oh, we we did um, we did mess up this question a little bit. So if there is no um, consortia there, you can just sit, type right into the chat box, and that just helps us identify where you are. That would be great. So thank you to the St. Thomas Lip for making that comment. All right, I'm gonna close that. So Lisa, there you go. You've got uh, you've got people who know their leads, but an equal amount who are still aren't sure where they stand. So that's great. Everybody can keep typing in there um, for your um, for anybody who's unclear. This all those comments are very helpful to Lisa. And I will just touch briefly on the typical membership um, because it is um, can be kind of confusing. So our typical users now um, are people who work for one of our member organizations. So for example, you can have an urban planner who works for a municipal government who's part of a local consortia, which is their, um, for example, a Toronto consortium. And that consortium then is part of the CDP. So all of our members right now, all of our users are part of a member organization, which is part of a local consortium, which is then part of the community data program. So we just wanted to let you guys know that this exists because it is a possibility for any of you who are looking for more of the data that you could actually just become a, a user or a, a join a local consortium. Um, if you are interested in that, you can let us know and we'll talk to you about that and figure out um, and get you in touch with your leads. And the difference between this and the um, pilot network that Lisa is going to speak about is that you would get the entire full benefits and memberships, which means you get a login for the website and you would be able to go into the community data catalog and download data tables as you wish. So that would be the biggest difference. And then I will hand it back to Lisa to go to the next slide. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, so as Mary just mentioned, it is to your advantage if you are in a location where there is a consortium that you can join. But as many of you are typing and we see, we know there's plenty of areas of Canada where there isn't an existing CDP consortia. So you are not going to be left hanging. We will become your portal into the CDP. So we are an existing consortia. Um, I am a member, City of Calgary, so I will become your avenue into the program. So it's probably helpful now for me to go through what our role is. So we are handling all of the administration related to the pilot. So that means everything from the financials, paying the fees, uh, legal contracts, um, collecting some of that core information, like where each of the LIP coordinators are located and their contact information, doing some comparison between the consortia leads and the LIP leads to see where there's some avenues to maybe bring people together. Um, we're also going to be developing a process to request data and we will not be doing that in isolation. That will be in consultation with you We'll put together a draft procedure and get it out to you for input and feedback. So because we are a full member, we do have access to the full catalog, we would then be able to go in and download tables for you. Mary is going to go through some of the data that's available in the catalog. They do already have a large number of tables on immigration in the existing catalog. But with the advent of this pilot, one of our ambitious goals is to further build out that data inventory with respect to immigration data. So we have a few uh, pieces of work underway right now on that front. I have been working closely with IRCC, um, their research director, through John Biles, our P&T lead. And we've been able to have some success on that front in terms of having that dialogue open um, about opening up some of IRCC's standard data products. So
So they have some existing things right now, like a permanent resident rounded data cube and a temporary resident rounded data cube. And even just using those two as a starting point would be a great addition to the work that we're doing. We do wanna have a bit of a phased approach to also look at some custom data tables that could be put together um, with IRCC data, but we would not be doing any of that on our own. We would be putting together an advisory table where members across the country could participate, put their name forward, and as a collective, we would then identify what types of data might be useful um, for different regions. I have had many of you contact me, so I know what some of the questions have been with respect to the pilot, so I just want to emphasize one right up the front. There is nothing you need to do to join the CDP LIP pilot. By default, everyone's just considered a participant, and it's entirely up to you if you choose to ever partake or not. There isn't a financial ramification since we are making the one lump payment for the entire network. Depending on where you're at in your LIP, you may be at a stage now where you'd like data access and we can facilitate it. Or you could be at a stage where you have no data needs um, for a year, let's say, and then you reach out to us. That's totally fine too. Or maybe you have access to tons of data never have a need, and that's also 100% okay. So there's really no obligation on your part. There's nothing you need to do to formalize um, participating. Anyone really that is a LIP has the opportunity to participate. So I just wanted to put those few pieces out there before um, I hand it back to Mary, because she's going to walk you through some of the resources that are available beyond data tables which in my opinion is critical. Many of us, even myself, when I started becoming involved with the CDP back in about 2010, had a much lower data background and capacity than I do now. And I found it really helpful to be able to participate in their webinars, training, learning events, and using their tools and resources to be able to put things together that were relevant for Calgary. So I'm going to pass it back to Mary. She's going to walk you through some of those options, and then I'll loop back to you a bit later in the presentation. Thank you, Lisa. I think that's helpful to get some of those initial questions out of the way. Um, so um, please continue typing those questions in the chat box. Um, I think it's really helpful to deal with them as we're going along. And hopefully you've noticed um, my colleague, um, Mike Dieter, is also on the uh, presentation today and is answering a lot of those questions in the chat box. So, uh, so feel free to keep doing those. So um, before we go any further, we're going to talk about what what is the data we're actually talking about? So let's just get into it. I'm going to give you sort of a broad overview of what kind of data we have. Um, the data we're looking for, we always try to get the smallest geography possible. So we're always talking um, sub-provincial, so smaller than the province. We look for lower and upper tier municipalities. And then whenever possible, we get the neighborhood level data. So that's at the dissemination area or census tract level. And those are Statistics Canada geographies. Um, one of the most interesting parts of our data catalog are the custom statistics we get. Um, so these are from Statistics Canada. We get custom cross tabulations and custom boundaries. So these are data tables that um, Statistics Canada does not provide to the public. We order them and we have to pay for them and we can get really rich data by doing that. The custom boundaries means that if you have specific geographies, um, for example, if you were looking for health regions in your um, in your neighborhoods or in sorry, if you're looking for health regions in your local area, you can actually order um, you can actually find the data for those custom um, boundaries that aren't Statistics Canada um, standard boundaries. Now, the lips themselves, um, I, at this point, we don't expect you to be producing custom boundaries, but you might find that they already exist. For example, I believe Winnipeg already has 
um, custom boundaries for health regions. So um, you might find they're already there. Um, we also provide analysis, reporting, and visualization tools, and I'm going to get into these and explain them a little bit later. And then we provide links to open data. So by open data, we mean um, data that's available to the public, a lot from Statistics Canada, but also, also from other organizations. So we just want to make sure that you can find them easily and you know that they exist. So the Community Data Program team has created a data map. So this is basically a, an inventory of all of the data tables we have. And we've sorted them by theme so that it's much easier to find things on common topics. So right now our catalog holds more than 898 tables. Um, so that's our, sort of our entire inventory. And we've looked through and out of those tables, we now have 59 tables that particularly deal with immigration. And within immigration, those dimensions, when we talk about immigration, we mean they include dimensions on immigrant status, period of immigration, place of birth or citizenship. And this is just a screenshot from our catalog, which shows some of the, um, some of the sources of our data. And I see Karen is asking about the data cube. So Lisa, would you wanna just speak to that right now? Sure, that's probably a good idea. I was starting to type. <laughs> Sorry, Mary, can you mute for a sec? Yeah. Um, so for those of you who missed it, Karen was asking a question on the side about the permanent resident and temporary resident rounded data cubes and wondering if those uh, would be available to the LIPS. So because of all the discussions we've started in terms of, you know, trying to access additional data sets, every discussion we have would be about putting data into the CDP catalog so everyone in the nation can access it. So whether people are part of a formal consortium and just go in and download it themselves, or whether they come to us and we download it for them and pass it on. Either way, everyone would have access. So I, can, I can't give you a date at this point, but I can say that the director of IRCC's research um, is supportive in doing this and has, from his level, tried to expedite the process to get that data available sooner rather than later. So we will um, do a formal announcement when we actually have the legal agreement executed and are able to do so. But for now, um, we can just say that the lots of work is happening behind the scenes to get that data open sooner rather than later. Thank you, Lisa. I think a lot of people are anticipating that. Um, so hopefully it comes soon and you can Pay attention for any standard or any uh, messages coming from Lisa about that timeline. Uh, we just wanted to show you a couple of actual example tables. Um, don't worry if these aren't super clear on your screen. I know they're small, so depending on how small your computer screen is, you might not have a good uh, a good view of them. But I'll just I'll sort of describe what they are here. This is a beyond 2020 file. This is how Statistics Canada delivers the data. Um, it's just a, a table format that is easily manipulated and you can actually export tables out of it into standard Excel tables. And it just helps to manipulate the data through this. Um, we actually have some guidelines on our website about using Beyond 2020 because a lot of people are nervous about it in the beginning, but it's actually quite a simple tool. Um, it's also something we've had webinars are, and, um, and so we have a lot of resources for using Beyond 2020. So this table here is an example of, um, it shows the target group profile of the immigrant population from the census. And so you can just see the census tracks on the top and the age groups on the side. And I'm just going to show you a few of these so you can just get an idea. These are just a couple of examples. So same thing, a Beyond 2020 table. This shows the place of birth by immigrant status and period of immigration. 
and it also breaks it down by age group and sex for the population in private households. And this is a table from the National Household Survey. There are third table. So this one, you can see um, how that how it's laid out. So you've got immigrant status and period of immigration on the top by labor force. And on the bottom or on the side here, you've got um, highest certificate of diploma or degree, and um, you've got location of study in this table, as well as options for the age group and sex for the population 15 years and older. Mary, if I could interrupt for one second, if you could mute. Perfect, thanks. I just wanted to be able to respond to the one question that came in just before we move too far along. Um, custom geographies, it's a good thing that question or that questions come up. Um, so for anyone who's part of a consortium, consortia leads have the opportunity to put in um, custom geography requests for their consortia. I know here at City of Calgary, we typically buy neighborhoods, we buy transportation zones, planning zones, and all kinds of boundaries that make sense for our planning purposes that don't necessarily align to StatsCan or some of the other data providers. Um, the custom geography requests for this past year already went in. Leads can still um, submit custom geography requests. That's part of um, one of the things Mike handles, who's part of the chat room on the side. Um, so sometime coming up this spring, um, I think is the timeline they're aiming for. That's where there will be the opportunity for additional custom geographies to be placed. For those of you that are not part of a consortium, um, custom geographies will not be part of the CDP um, inventory because there isn't a consortia that's able to put them through. However, if there are a lot of LIPs in that circumstance where they have no ability to join a CDP and they have an unusual geography that can't be aggregated, then we would look um, to have that conversation with IRCC to see, again, nationally, can they just resource us to purchase those tables directly from StatsCan or the other data providers. We're doing some of that right now within the PNT region as we're working on a data dashboard as we have three LIPs that have unusual geographies. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and hopefully you've had a chance to look at this table. Um, so this just shows country of citizenship as well as immigration status and sex for total population living in private households. And this is also from the National Household Survey. So those are just an example. Like I said before, we actually have 59 tables that directly deal with immigration. And so uh, these are just a selection of four of them. One of the things we also offer on the website, which you can go and download, is just an Excel file that lists every single table we have in our catalog. Um, I find this very helpful sometimes when I'm just doing keyword searches or if I just want to have an overall glance of what's available. And so if you would like to just go through and browse the topics and the tables um, just by name, this is a nice um, document that you have access to. Um, and there's the uh, link to find it on our website at the bottom. So uh, hopefully that gives you sort of insight into what we're talking about when we talk about the data itself. And now I just want to go through some of those additional tools and program resources that Lisa was mentioning. Um, that we think are so useful and really need to go hand in hand with delivering data because data itself is not that useful unless you can manipulate it and do something with it. So um, we also realize that many of our members don't have training to work with data. Um, people come from all different sectors and different backgrounds. And so we've done our best to provide a multitude of resources. Um, some of those are for those higher capacity users who entire jobs revolve around data. 
and some of them are for our modest capacity users and some of them are for people who really don't have any experience. So um, just a small selection of what we do. Um, we do have a number of small how-to videos. We've tried to make these very short and sweet and very specific. These will help you navigate the program itself, how to navigate our catalog, um, just different little topics to help you do more with the data. We also have some really um, fun and engaging infographics. So an infographic, you can see um, there's a sample on there right now. It's basically a document that is already formatted. It's laid out. Um, there's some engaging graphic design work that's already been done. And you simply take this and you fill in your own numbers. So all you need to do is download the, doc the infographic and then download those data tables, find the numbers you need and type them in. And so this is a document that you could actually produce and print out and have as any kind of report you're doing, any kind of program or workshop. If you want to do something talking about your community and you want people to know more about um, how it's broken up. Um, so these are great. And right now we have a couple of different ones available. So we have one on education, one on income, one on employment, etc. So these are these are really great tools. And then we also have a webinar series. Um, we do program orientations, which help people understand more about our data catalog and how to actually find the data, how to download it. Um, we su do support for Beyond 2020 so that people have a chance to learn more about how to use the, um, the software that Statistics Canada provides for their tables. Um, we also do some um, networking and sharing of what other people are producing and working on, other projects that are going on through our webinars. And this is just very helpful because sometimes what Lisa is doing in Calgary is very helpful for those of you in Halifax. And we don't always have a chance to meet in person to talk about them. So we also make use of our webinar formats for those. So this is always my favorite part of the presentation and I hope is really eye-opening to you. So I just want to show you some of the examples of the work that other members have already done with the data. Uh, we've tried to pull all samples that have to do with immigration, although obviously our members are working on many different topics, but we wanted to show you some things that um, might hit home for you guys. So this first project is from the region of Halton and they developed a newcomer strategy using community indicators, um, such as the new, immigrant, the new immigrant arrival trends in the region. This is from 2013. The second one is from Simcoe County and Simcoe produced uh, census and NHS bulletins and so this one shows data on immigration and citizenship in, Sim, in Simcoe. So you can just see how visually these would really tell a story about your community. The Region of Peel website has profiles for each of their wards. And so this table, um, which is one of their wards, shows um, the period of immigration for people that live in their wards. So this is not a report, but in fact, an online portal that you can go in and, and do some research if you're looking at information about region appeal. In Ottawa, they've developed indicators using the community data, and this one shows the birthplace of Ottawa's immigrants. Again, this is an online portal so you can go through and, and have a look. Okay, and this final table just shows the low income and visible minority groups and generation status in the Toronto CMA. So these are all examples of work our members have already done and how they've chosen to display it or make use of it. Mary, if I could hop on. Sure. 
Uh, just to make a comment about this one before the slide advances, I had asked Mary to put this slide in. This was when Toronto had put together um, just because it had really struck me when I saw it in a previous presentation, just in terms of the story that can be told when you're looking at data. If you actually take a sec um, and look at some of the individual ethnocultural results here, you'll see that, for example, in the case of uh, the third column, black, the poverty rates are actually higher for second generation and third generation third generation immigrants. So that's quite astounding and kind of contrary to what the typical thought is around, you know, really those recent newcomers having the highest poverty rate. So there's some really interesting trends and stories that can come out of this data. Just give you another second to look at this one because it really is a compelling, um, a compelling, you know, just um, just a compelling table to show you what's going on in Toronto. And this is from the 2016 census data that just came out in the fall. This presentation will also be available to everyone afterwards. So if you want to have a chance to look at these slides a little bit more, um, you'll have it in your hands. Um, what is NIE? Uh, I'm trying to remember that category. Mike, can you take that question? The visible minority NIE. What is the NIE not included elsewhere? Thank you very much, Sharon. <laughs> So I'm going to hand it back to Lisa again to just have a bit of discussion about the possibilities for what this um, this partnership between this pilot network could could produce. Thanks, Mary. Um, one of the things I wanted to touch on that we haven't addressed yet, and that is uh, the cities that don't have a consortium but are actually big enough to sustain one and what role LIPS might be able to play to help get one started. So I saw Samim, you typed in early in the beginning saying you don't think Edmonton has one. You are correct, Edmonton does not have one, although they're certainly large enough to sustain one. Um, so when we think about the people that we convene and the organizations that we work with, um, many of those organizations are larger, do have a broad reach in the community, and likely would have capacity to be that lead for a consortium, which is really kind of equivalent to us being um, a LIP coordinator. So it's kind of playing that backbone organization role um, to coordinate, to collect fees, and to be the point person to convene people locally around data. The advantage to that, I can speak from Calgary's specific circumstances. When I look at the organizations that I have around the table for my CLIP Council, it's very similar to the organizations that are around the table for our data consortium. So the benefit to that is I have the CEO strategic leadership level at my council, but I have the actual hands-on data geeks from those same organizations at, at our CDP table. So that's a perfect marriage to then be able to look at opportunities for some local data sets and to, to think about forming some partnerships around research or data sharing that potentially haven't been considered before. And with those CEO level people sitting at the council, there's a bit more impetus, I think, for people to collaborate and participate. So I wanted to put that plug in. Um, if there is the opportunity for anyone in a larger city where they think, hey, I think we should have a consortium, the CDP is there to help with that role they have whole recruitment packages that answer all of the types of questions a new person might have. And so they would be your best point person to help facilitate that discussion. 
Now, I touched on some of these things already. We will be trying to pursue more data on immigration, not exclusive to IRCC, but IRCC, of course, would be an important partner. We have um, locally here, just even in terms of some of the data work we've been doing in PNT region, um, examples are reaching out to the um, Immigrant Access Fund that funds newcomers across the country to receive money for additional training or um, um, anything they require to re-enter their field of profession. And they keep a lot of interesting data like income levels prior to the loan and income levels post loan. So you're really able to see some striking differences. And I know for many of us, employment and economic well-being are important lip goals that we're all working for in our strategy. So um, that will definitely be on our agenda going forward to seek out new data sources. I already touched on the custom geographies and the possibility of translating in French. I put a little note in our chat box just to say if there is interest for people to have the tools in French, like the, um, any, the data visualization templates or things like that, that's something we could have a discussion with IRCC about to see if we could get funding for translation for those pieces. We would just want to know if there's uptake first. So I think we've hit on um, everything else, and I'm going to pass. Um, Lisa, I want to go back and just address a question from Jill Hensley, which says, could you speak to the advantages of participating in the LIP CDP if our municipality already has a CDP? So um, I'll just, I guess, start with if your member organization, so if the organization you work for is already part of a community data program, please get in touch with um, your lead because uh, you'll get the fullest ability to go in there and get data um, by just doing the typical membership route and signing up. Um, if there's already a consortia, you can actually um, have your member organization speak to the consortium lead. So you can go to the consortia lead and say, I would like my member organization to be part of this consortia. Um, there is usually some cost sharing involved. Um, often it's about a $125 member fee, um, but we can help you sort that out with your local consortium. So contact us because we can definitely do that and have you brought in fully. Um, if the advantage to doing the lip route is that there is, there's no fees, it's already being covered. So your consortium fee is already paid. Um, so I can just start going through this slide. Um, the consortium fee is already paid for the LIP pilot network. And so there's nothing now standing in your way of, of talking to Lisa and getting the data tables, um, although we don't quite have a timeline for delivery yet, but, um, but there's no barrier there. But if you think you're gonna make really good use of the data, if there's already consortium in place, please speak to Lisa, speak to us, because we can definitely find a way for you to be brought in as a full member. Um, so just following up that, she's asking, is there an advantage in terms of having access to data across the country for comparison? All of our members have data, have access to data from all of Canada. So you're not limited to data from only your local area. Um, that's important distinction. Um, the tables always cover Canada, except when we get into custom geographies, because you know we don't we don't do a custom geographies for all of Canada necessarily. It, those are more specific. Um, but yeah, no, you get you get access to all of that data. Um, the difference with the Lit Network is that you can't simply log on to the website and pull off the tables as you want them. You're going to have to go through uh, Lisa in Calgary to download the tables and then get them to you. So it's going to be a delayed process and there's going to be a limit to um, how fast that can work. Does that answer your question, Joe? Okay, great. Um, 
So sort of these are the next step where we go from here. As we said, you're already paid unless you want to become part of a um, your local consortium and then you get in touch with us or with Lisa and we will uh, walk you through that. Um, Lisa is available for questions. So, oh, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Sorry, I was just going to make one comment. Yeah, just because this, um, now at the late stage, we're just mentioning the $125 to become a member. Um, so that's just an administrative fee that the um, CDP charges for all of the admin support that they provide in terms of the program. Um, so the way it works is we've paid the consortium fee nationally for all the LIPS. So anyone that's approaching their consortium would likely pay the $125. And if there was um, a circumstance where there was confusion or your local consortium lead maybe is new or it's out of the loop about the pilot, just loop back in with us and um, between myself and CDP, we'll be able to figure out a solution that's going to work for everybody. So we know there could be one-offs throughout, um, but by and large, try to join your local consortium if you can. And there are currently LIPS that have joined their consortium um, even prior to this pilot starting. So there is the opportunity if you were wanting to connect with any of those folks just to see um, how engaged they've been, if they've used data yet, maybe they're still kind of a newbie and are using it a bit more for the collaborative benefits. But I know offhand, um, Bow Valley, for example, is a member of their local consortium. So there could be the opportunity for um, future chatting with some of those folks if you guys would like. Thanks, Lisa. I think that's a great idea. So the other thing to look forward to coming up was Lisa is going to have to form an advisory committee, which would be a selection of LIPS who would like to be more involved in developing the network. Um, this would be a chance to really have input into how the pilot and relationship is going, and then also uh, input into getting um, data tables, which data tables are coming out of the program and being delivered to the LIPS. And also if there's any resources and tools and any other training that you'd like access to um, that will come through the advisory committee. So Lisa will be forming that shortly. So just stay, stay aware of that um, and she'll be following up with all of you. And um, the final thing, but I think for many people, the most um, hands-on thing is that we will get those uh, 59 tables on immigration. That will be the first, um, the first big deliverable through the LIPS will be these 59 tables on immigration and those will be made available through Lisa. And I'll just let Lisa finish off with her comments before we wrap up. Hi everybody. This one uh, was a bit of a surprise. As of this morning, I've been talking with IRCC and I let them know about this um, webinar and that I was going to have many of you online um, because there is an announcement that some of you are going to be surprised about. I was as well. Um, and that is that we in Calgary are now going to be hosting a national LIPS learning event in March. Yes, March of 2018, right around the corner. So we know many of you are going to have questions about that, that potentially you've already spent your travel money, potentially you've already, <laughs> yes, Sabine, this March, um, it's kind of out of the blue. Um, but we are going to be taking care of all the logistics. Um, so it doesn't matter if your travel money is already spent. It doesn't matter um, if you didn't have, um, if you weren't planning for it. None of us were really. <laughs> yes, definitely bringing skis. We had a blizzard last night. Um, so we're going to take this opportunity, though, um, to be able to include components specifically about data, 
about the CDP pilot. Um, we've got a poll question just popping up on the screen here. The reason I'm asking is because some of you are potentially already coming to the Metropolis conference in March um, because we are going to be butting up against those dates probably just before the Metropolis conference. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that if you have additional questions now that we've had this webinar, we're going to be forming an advisory committee where, where we'll be developing the agenda for the conference. So this would be um, a good opportunity now that we're finishing the webinar to think about things you might like to delve in deeper about, and then we can include it and cover it in the conference. Um, the dates, again, would just be leading up to Metropolis, so I think that would be the March 19th and, or sorry, March 20th and 21st, and then Metropolis starts March 22nd to 24th. So for those of you who have already booked flights to come for Metropolis, then if there's a change fee to change your flight, we would be covering that in Calgary. And it looks like Mike has a comment about the slide, too. And I'll just say, because we know not everyone is on the webinar today, so we will be following up with an email. Literally, IRCC has emailed me in the middle of the webinar that it's now cleared and a go-ahead. So look forward to an email from us with more details, and I'm looking forward to seeing you guys uh, next month. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Hi, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I, the 59 tables on immigration that was taken from the, sort of comparing to what we have already in the catalog. Yes, that's what exists currently in the catalog, Mike. Oh, okay, yeah, I would, this isn't referring to 2016 uh, census tables. No. Just, oh, okay, yeah. great. Yeah, because there's, there's a lot more than in that case, there's a lot more to come. That's right. This uh, 59 is simply what we already have, and so we're waiting for the order. Wait, I mean, Mike, do you want to speak to the data order that's coming for 2016? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're, we're we're still planning acquisition, putting in orders, putting in cost estimate requests. There's a lot of work going on on that front. Um, but we are, yeah, and there should be a list somewhere of the 59 tables. I think uh, some extract of that catalog file that Mary showed would um, would be able to tell you what those tables are. Um, so I mean, looking at what we're ordering imminently from the 2016 census, uh, we have about 18 or so slated so far with a lot of pretty interesting cross tabs that we've like uh, about anything you can imagine from the census, uh, really trying to capture, uh, use the new the new uh, dimensions, the admission uh, admission category. Sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, the applicant. I think it's admission category. category. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, our working group is trying to integrate immigration data into a lot of previous tables that we purchased. So there should be quite a rich set of data coming out of the 2016 census. That's great. Thank you, Mike. Um, so Mike works um, primarily on the data and he leads our data and data purchase and access working group. And so this is a group of leads that come together to really work through the data order. And so all of your comment and feedback um, that if you want to have input on the actual data that's coming into the program, that can go through the advisory committee with Lisa. And then all of those go to Mike. So it's quite a complicated process getting all the tables ordered and selected and involves a lot of um, 
cost analysis. So Mike works away on that with his group of leads in that working group. And so uh, because we have all the 2016, um, all the basic tables are now done and we're working on those customized orders. And we do have, um, we do take advantage of the new data that's coming available, but we also try to get the tables we have, um, the, the last census tables we've done, we try to get the same data for the next one. So we have the comparisons as well. Um, so this will just be very exciting. It's, I think very exciting for you guys to be coming in and starting this pilot because we're gonna be getting those custom tables over the next little while. Um, and then also sounds like there's a lot of support on the federal side. So I think you guys are, um, I, I think this is an exciting time for you guys and I'm looking forward to this, this partnership between us. Um, so I just put up our email address and Lisa's email address there. I think you're going to be hearing quite a lot from Lisa in the next little while about this conference coming up, about the advisory committee and any other data notices that you're going to get. Um, please feel free to be in touch directly with us. Um, our, our email address for all of us is information at communitydata.ca. Lisa's is there, lisa.davis at calgary.ca. So don't be shy. Please feel free to ask any questions and we can follow up with conversations if that's easier for anybody who has a particular membership question uh, or you're looking for any other resources. Lisa, do you have anything to add before we close off for the late morning for me? Because I'm out on Vancouver Island, <laughs> afternoon for many of you. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, I know there's lots of um, commentary coming in about the conference now, so don't sweat the dates too much yet. Uh, that will get ironed out. I know everyone, there's conflicts for lots of people. Um, there was just the desire by A or CC to try butt it up against Metropolis since they will have a lot of people coming for that as well. But we'll handle that separately. I will send an email and we'll get some more info to you. But I want to thank you all for participating. And for those who couldn't make it live for watching the webinar, um, because I'm really excited about the initiative and to see where it takes us in 2018-19. So thanks everyone for participating. And I just want to say thank you to Lisa so much for all of her work that she's doing, getting this pilot off the ground and really being an advocate for all the lips. Uh, so thank you very much for your work, Lisa. And I just want to thank uh, Julie, who's been doing a lot of our technical support today and getting this set up. And for Mike for answering so many of your data and membership questions. So thank you to my team here as well. Um, please feel free to um, get in touch with us. And this presentation, as well as an audio recording, are available if you would like the slides. Um, just go through Lisa and we'll make sure that it gets to you. So thank you, everyone. Bye for now.